Welcome to our webinar called Wisdom of the Body, Let Feed Be Thy Medicine. Our presenter today is Dr. Fred Provinza. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust, and I am Larissa McKenna, Fax Humane Farming Program Director. I'll be moderating today's session. So let me just take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions before we dive right into the presentation. We have a lot to cover today. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust are fact. We are a nonprofit organization. We're based in Illinois and we do work nationally. And we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. And we accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, um, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also helping consumers make um, wise and informed food choices. So I have the honor and pleasure of directing the Humane Farming Program, which uh, means I get to work with livestock and poultry farmers across the country. Uh, in fact, provides a number of services for farmers, including uh, conference scholarships, um, personalized handouts, grants, a mentorship program, and of course, uh, a variety uh, or webinars on a variety of topics. So please, you're invited to visit our website to learn more about our farmer services. And this time, I'm pre I'm just delighted to present or uh, introduce our acclaimed presenter, Dr. Fred Provenza. Fred grew up in Colorado, working on a ranch while attending school at uh, in wildlife biology at Colorado State University. He's currently a professor emeritus of behavioral ecology. Uh, in the Department of Wildlife Resources at Utah State University, where he's worked for 35 years. He's been directing a research group uh, that's pioneered an understanding of how learning influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soils, plants, herbivores, and humans. So he is the author of three books and hundreds of peer-reviewed peer articles, and it really is an honor and a pleasure to have him with us both today and in the coming weeks. Um, so that he can share his vast experience and expertise with our community. So I think without further ado, uh, Fred, I'm going to turn the floor over to you so that you can start your presentation. <laughs> okay, Larissa, it's wonderful to be here with you and with all of, the, all of the folks today. It really is an honor and a privilege to spend time with you and uh, you know, looking through the questions that you've sent in, they're fabulous questions, I think, uh, throughout the, the course of the three presentations. And starting today, be able to really touch on many of the questions that, that you raise. Um, so the first topic, this idea of, uh, that goes under this broad heading of wisdom of the body. And then today, let's talk about let feed be thy medicine. I'd like to just step back a second and... Uh, pick up on what Larissa was saying. 50 years ago right now, I was working on a ranch in Colorado, and I was, as she said, going to Colorado State University. And I was majoring in wildlife biology, and we were learning about ecology. And ecology was a fairly young discipline back in those days. So I was having that experience at Colorado State University. And then I was working with this man here in the picture, Henry DeLuca, on, on his ranch. And uh, so I, I was ha had the, the hands-on learning, working with Henry and working with sheep and cattle. And we had a few pigs on the place and growing crops. So we were farming and ranching both. But I, well, the point I want to make is back in those days, I would have never imagined that the world of ecology and the world of agriculture would come together in the ways that, that I've seen take place here, especially in the last decade or so, it's it's just amazing to me, and uh, it's that flavor that I want to build into the to the presentations, the three presentations that I'm honored to to be able to give with you. Um, so we we studied animal behavior uh, in the ways that I'm going to, going to talk about, and we we worked a lot with livestock producers, especially ranchers. And we were thinking about what are ways to cut the costs of, of ranching. And, uh, you know, we, we were really winding around to ideas like this. Once people understand how form and function and behavior evolve, 
um, we can create innovative practices that nurture and transform the systems that we're working in. And we used to think all the time, unlike costly fossil fuel intensive infrastructures such as corrals, fences, machinery, and so forth, understanding and working with behavioral processes costs very little. It's what's in our brains, not what's in our pocketbooks that counts. And it's really learning to farm and ranch and consume in the image of nature. I think it's learning that we're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, we do to ourselves. Um, and in the words of Aldo Leopold, who I was learning about 50 years ago, and his book, A Sand County Almanac, he says, we abuse land because we guard it as commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. So that's a little of the flavor uh, that we'll have as we go throughout the three presentations. So we'll start today with this notion of let feed be thy medicine. Uh, then we'll move next week to let food be our medicine. And we'll build on what we talk about today, but start to integrate how, you know, the linkages from soil plant diversity to plant diversity, plant diversity and its influence on soil, that relationship, how that influences the health of livestock, and then how that influences the quality of meat and dairy products for human consumption. So we'll really be scaling across several, several dimensions the next, next week when we talk about let food be our medicine. And then we'll, we'll finish with this notion of herbivore culture and culture more generally, actually human and herbivore culture and the tremendously important role that culture plays and what happens when we break uh, or don't have really functional cultural linkages with one another in the landscapes we inhabit. So that's just kind of briefly where we'll go over the three weeks. Let's talk about this idea of of uh, uh, let feed be thy medicine. And really what we studied over the years with it was this idea of nutritional wisdom of the body. And there are three legs to that stool. And if you break any one of those legs, you're not going to be able to have nutritional wisdom manifest. If you break all three legs to the stool, as one could argue that we have in from the human standpoint, at least here in the, in the United States, and we can argue that that's the case too oftentimes with the animals that we care for, then you're certainly not going to have uh, nutritional wisdom manifest. So the three legs are one, the availability of alternatives. For this session here, we're talking about plant diversity, a diverse array of different plants available to animals, and we'll go into that. But choice and ability to choose is very important to enable individuals to meet their needs for, for nutrients and then to self-medicate, both preventatively and, and uh, therapeutically. So that's one leg. There's another leg that, that uh, is not so obvious, but it's powerful. It's, it's a really important one, and we're going to emphasize it today, and it's this idea of flavor feedback, this idea that liking for food is being mediated by cells and organ systems throughout the body, including the microbiome, but not just the microbiome. The, the brain, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the pancreas, they all have specific needs for different kinds of nutrients. So their nutritional needs have to be met. And it's these metabolically mediated feedbacks that alter liking as a function of need for the whole body. It's an amazing, amazingly uh, intricate system. And we want to talk about that today. Uh, the, the social cultural part is the third leg to the stool. We won't say much about that. Uh, uh, we'll allude to it in this section and build on it a little bit more in the next presentation. And then in the, the last session, we'll really focus on that specifically. So let's talk about flavor feedback relationships as a way to start this into this conversation and as a way to work into the many, many good questions that, that you had as you've gone along. And I wanna start with some food for thought questions um, that have to do with, with experiences that I, that I had. You know, when, when you're involved in farming and ranching or, or working in research, which I, 
did all of those things. You, if you're interested in animals, you make obs- you you watch them, you make observations. And uh, when I was a young graduate student, 45 years ago now, um, we were using goats in southern Utah, southern part of the state, in the southwestern part of the U.S., uh, and they were in this black brush dominated landscape. That that's picture at the top with the goats and the one at the bottom with the cattle. That that's that's um, that's the kind of landscapes we were working in. And the idea was that we would use goats during the winter to prune black brush shrubs, and then that would stimulate new growth on the plants. And we knew that would happen. This this slide here in the middle is a plant that was browsed in the spring, and there was a good moisture in the or browsed in the winter, good moisture in the spring, produced lots of growth. And we knew that that new growth was higher in energy, protein, minerals. It was better uh, from approximate analysis than the old woody woody twigs on these plants. Uh, but yet most of the goats strongly avoided eating the current season's twigs. So that the food for thought question for you is why, why aren't they eating what appears to be the most nutritious uh, plant parts? We, as we went on in our studies, we were working with a compound called polyethylene glycol. And we found that if we gave goats a little bit of supplemental polyethylene glycol, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along, then the goats all started to really like the new growth that was on the black brush plant. So the question again is, here, here it's the same. It's the same plant material. Presumably, the taste hasn't changed a bit, and yet if we supplement them with polyethylene glycol, now their preference increases. So, why is that happening? What's going on with these animals? The third food for thought question for you has to do with something we observe. So, what the first winter when we were using goats to browse black brush, we were working with angora goats. These in this picture, and we had set up six, six pastures. Uh, down there, big pastures, uh, one, two, and four hectare pastures, two and a half, five, and ten acre pastures. We'd set up six of those. And, but the goats in this picture here were on one of the, the, the pastures, and the, they started to eat these wood rat houses. This picture to the right here is a picture of a, of a big wood rat house at the base of a juniper tree. Now, black brush looks bad, but when you look at that wood rat house, that looks even worse. So the question is, why on earth would goats eat wood rat houses? The last food for thought for you, let's move away from the goats and the black brush, and let's move to Arizona, and let's talk about cattle. And uh, <clears throat> when we were doing this research, um, well into it, we got a letter one time from, from a rancher in uh, in Arizona with a question. And he said, you know, I've ranched for 30 years and I've never lost one animal to poisonous plants in that entire time. He said, but we had a drought strike and the best thing I could do was to split my herd. I moved part of the herd um, from the home country in Hia County to Apache County. And he said the animals in Apache County suffered severe, severe losses. Um, and he said, here's the thing though, it's the same poisonous plants in Hia County as it is in Apache County. So what's going on? Why on earth did the cattle that were moved to Apache County die from eating the poisonous plants, whereas the ones that were left in, in Hia County didn't have any problems at all. So we'll wind our way back to these food for thoughts, but just to get you thinking a little bit about some of the observations that I made and that many other people made over time, and then trying to think about why, what's happening with the animals in these cases. Now, when I went when I was a young graduate student and I told some of my professors at Utah State what I was observing that the goats were doing, especially when they were avoiding what appeared to us to be the most nutritious growth, the current season's growth, uh, one of the toxicologists I was working with said, well, I guess that just goes to show that domestic animals lack nutritional wisdom. And it, what he was saying reflected the views at that time. Um, there was the idea that wild animals obviously must still have nutritional wisdom. Otherwise, how could they be 
selecting the foods they need to help them uh, meet their needs. People didn't even talk about self-medicate, but that would be a part of that as well. But the thought was that as a result of 10,000 years of domestication, uh, cattle, sheep, and goats had lost their ability and their nutritional wisdom. So that's a question then that we want to, to address here. Have the, did they really lose their nutritional wisdom? And if not, how does that, how does that work? Especially when you start to work with plants across landscapes and you, you realize there can be, you know, 50, 75, 100 different plant species on these kind of landscapes where I work during my career. And then you realize that some species and plant parts are nutritious. Others can be quite toxic, actually. And you realize individual plants can be nutritious or toxic depending on the time of day, the week or the season, and the resources available in the environment where the plant's growing. So in this, this picture here, you see an orange plant that's a paintbrush plant. What we're saying is that if that plant brush plant is growing on a fertile site versus an infertile site, a wet site versus a dry site, and the sun versus the shade, it's going to be different chemically. Uh, and so plant animals, um, question we were asking back in the day, can they figure that out? And can they, can they learn that, you know, if you eat paintbrush growing under these conditions, it may not be so good for you. On the other hand, if you, if you eat it under these conditions, it can be quite, quite good. So I was trying to say there are a lot of challenges that we learned about that animals face. Um, and so the question is, how, how are they able to, to meet their needs given those challenges? Um, especially given the the fact that, you know, they don't have nutritionists within their flocks that we know of. There's not necessarily pharmacists out there. There's not veterinarians. So how how do wild animals accomplish what they do, given that they don't have this kind of help? And then what what do we know about domestic animals related to these kind of issues? So with that by way of background, let's start out with a question. And I, I would simply ask you, uh, and it's one that, that was discussed all the time during my career, what is palatability? And if I were to ask you then as a follow-up, why do you like a particular food? Odds are you'd tell me you like the food because it tastes good. And if I were to ask you why you don't like a particular food, odds are you'd tell me because it tastes bad. And that's exactly the, the case. Our experience of eating is guided by the flavors of foods and our like or dislike for those foods. But what I want to get you thinking about, not only for, for domestic and wild animals, and this, this includes not only cattle, sheep, goats, any kind of animal. It's been studied in many, many different species, including omnivores, omnivorous humans, and and pigs and so forth and so on. What I want to get you thinking about is palatability is more than a matter of taste. It involves feedback. And that feedback is coming from these the compounds that are in the foods we're eating, these so-called primary compounds and these secondary compounds. And I'll talk a lot about these different classes of compounds. So let me just say a word about that before, before I do. But it's this it's this interrelationship that's really important. The feedback is coming from cells and organ systems in response to primary and secondary compounds, and that's altering liking for the flavor. So what we experience and what, what the animals experience, so far as we know, is simply do I like it or don't like it, and under what conditions do I like it or don't like it. So with regard to these primary and secondary compounds, the primaries are the, what we would typically think of as energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, and so forth. But from a plant standpoint, and as we'll talk about next time, what we're learning about is that both plant and animal foods, meat and dairy, can also contain these secondary compounds that animals get from the foods that they eat. And we don't need to go into detail on the secondary compounds because they're, they're for one there's tens of thousands of these compounds they are talked about in broad classes such as phenolics terpenes and alkaloids and i'll mention those as we go um, but it's not so important to get caught up in trying to 
uh, know all the specifics of all these different compounds at the level we'll talk about uh, during these presentations, it's just important to appreciate that plants contain these compounds. And here's several examples. For instance, uh, trefoil contains tannins, which are phenolic compounds. Um, sanfoin, another legume, contains tannins. A shrub that's common in the western U.S., bitterbrush, contains tannins. Uh, sagebrush, another common shrub in the, in the western U.S., contains terpenes. Alfalfa or lucerne uh, has saponins. Tall fescue has alkaloids and so forth and so on. The point I'm uh, trying to make is simply to, to say that all plants contain these compounds. There's a lot that's known about the kinds of compounds that different plants contain. And then as we go on, including today, we'll start to talk about relationships between primary and secondary compounds and why that, why uh, the mix of plant species that's available on a plaster can really matter in, in significant ways for, for, uh, for livestock, for the health of soils. We'll get into that next week and so forth and so on. So if we go back 45 years ago and I, I'm telling the professors what I'm seeing and they're saying, I guess this just goes to prove that, prove that animals don't ha contain, have nutritional wisdom. You know, I didn't believe it. I don't know why. And there were a few of us grad students who used to talk and we'd say, well, you know, but if we wanted to prove to our professors that animals have nutritional wisdom, how would we do that? How do you, how would you show that? And we, we spent a lot of time thinking and talking. And there were some professors, so I would think of one old professor that I, I knew and loved. And, you know, he'd get in on the conversations, but it wasn't so easy. I mean, in retrospect, it's like, okay, well, this is how we, how we came about doing this. But at the time, we were really perplexed. But as we worked our way through it, we figured this is the best way to try to demonstrate this. And first off, we said, let's make animals mildly deficient, not strongly deficient. Let's make them mildly deficient in a, in a nutrient. And we started with energy because we thought if you can't show that they'll select for, for energy, um, we're probably not going to see anything with protein, with minerals and vitamins and so forth. So we started with, with energy and we did the following. On odd days, we would offer animals, and I'm gonna, we're gonna show you a video here of sheep. So let's talk about sheep. It's the same for goats, for cows, for pigs, for whatever you wanna do for human beings. But we had animals in one group, and on odd days, we'd give them apple flavored straw, which straw, as you know, is, is not, a, not, a, uh, not a great feed. Um, it's, a, it's fair, but it's, it's not great. So we chose straw deliberately from that standpoint. So we'd give them apple flavored straw for, a, for an hour long meal. The animals in group two got maple flavored straw for an hour. And then after the, that meal, we'd take a stomach tube and we'd simply drench them with, with water. Now that only makes sense in relation to what we did on even days. We'd switch the flavors, but now after the meal, we drench them with the nutrient that they were lacking. And that's the key to the deal. And then during testing, we'd simply offer them a choice between apple and maple flavored straw. Now our idea was that if they can pick up on feedback from nutrients that they need, and they associate that with the flavor of food they've just eaten, then that should be a way to show that animals have nutritional wisdom. And in group one, for instance, we would say would have said they should strongly prefer apple flavored to maple flavored food because, or they should strongly prefer maple flavored to apple flavored food because after they ate the maple, they got the nutrient they needed. Um, the animals in, in group two should prefer the apple flavored food. And so rather than show you a ton of data that we produced over many years, I wanna first have Larissa show you a video of what that looks like. So we've got two groups of sheep in this video. One group after they ate the straw was drenched with energy. The other group was drenched with water. And there's a totally different response to, you know, the one group you're going to see loves, loves the straw. The other group can't figure out what the, why the one group likes the straw at all. So Larissa, let's show that and then we'll build on that.
Okay. Perfect, Larissa. That was good. Worked like a charm. So every time I watch that, I think of this quote from Dave Barry, uh, where he said, what are calories? He's talking about we humans, of course. He says, calories are little units that measure how good a particular food tastes. Fudge, for example, has a great many calories, whereas celery, which is not really a food at all, but a member of the plywood family, provided by Mother Nature, so we'd have a way to get onion dip into our mouths at parties, has none. That's exactly, if you add the feed feedback term to that, or the feedback to that, that's exactly what's happening. And this is getting ahead a little bit. We'll go there next time. In the next presentation, I want to talk more about our dietary habits and some of the linkages that happen there. But this is exactly what people in the food industry have figured out to do. You take a familiar flavor, something we're familiar with, cherry, apple, whatever, that, and you, you create a synthetic flavor. There's like 600 of them that have been or more now. You link familiar flavors with refined carbohydrates to lure people to the novel food by dressing it in a known and liked flavor and reinforcing the flavor with a blast of energy. That's exactly what we did with those sheep in that, in that particular example there. And we'll, we'll come back to that next week. But for now, let's focus on, on, the, on the herbivores and, uh, and dive more into the topic. So this is as much as I'm going to say relative to all the different studies we did, but I want to make the point that we started out with energy and we looked at that in a variety of different forms, everything from glucose uh, and volatile fatty acids to starch and cellulose. Uh, we went on to work with protein and we looked at that in different forms, non-protein, nitrogen, ruminally degradable uh, protein, bypass protein. In all those cases, we were finding that feedback from energy and protein conditions, strong preferences as a function of need. We then looked at protein to energy ratios as a function of need. We know that a young growing animal has higher needs for protein relative to energy. A lady who's pregnant and so forth, or an animal that's pregnant. So an animal that's got internal parasite load has higher needs. So we were looking under all those conditions and seeing that animals were selecting based on their needs and altering protein energy ratios and even rates at which those ferment. But let's, we don't need to go into that. Then we started working with minerals, sodium, phosphorus, calcium, selenium, sulfur, and showing that animals can self-select when they're deficient in those nutrients and that they can learn to pair different flavors with different nutrients. So we could really ask them questions related to free choice. You know, well, if we make you deficient in sodium or phosphorus, let's say, or selenium, whichever, it doesn't matter. Will you select the flavor of a food that was paired with that, with recovery from that de deficit? Um, our colleagues and friends in Australia went on to work with vitamin E showing the same sort of things. Then we worked with all these secondary compounds and, um, you know, back in the early days, 45 years ago, they were viewed as deterrents, as feeding deterrents. In the ecological literature, they were viewed more as toxins in the agronomic literature. But we've really come to realize that it all depends on the dose. And in low doses, um, these compounds really have a lot of health benefits, which we'll explore completely as we, we go along here in this series of presentations. Um, and we came to realize, like in all facets of life, I guess, it's, a, these, it's incredibly complex because it's not just primary or secondary compounds, it's interactions amongst those that I'll, I'll try to, to elaborate on as we go along here, what I mean. And then uh, from a secondary compound standpoint, there's this whole business of medicines and the roles that they can play in medicines. And so it's really about interrelationships and feedback from primary and secondary compounds as a function of needs for nutrients, for medicines, and, uh, and liking for food then is a function of combinations of foods that are available and the nutritional state of the animal. Let's build on that as we go. I know I'm saying, trying to say a bunch there, but it's, what's amazing to me is to realize the degree to which cells and organ systems are, are um, integrating. You know, if you think, why does any creature eat? What's being fed? It's cells, ultimately, and the cells are each conscious. They have their own 
brain, the membrane with thousands of receptor sites. Um, and so they're foraging. They're, you can think of nutrients coming through capillaries, the primary and secondary compounds, as a stream, and these cells are foraging. And then the key point we're trying to make is through hormones, neurotransmitters, peptides, they're feeding back. And uh, today I was reminded of something that uh, I'd written in this book, Nourishment, that I, I wrote, that there are far more nerves that are projecting from the organ systems of the body to the central nervous system than there are nerves from the central nervous descend nervous system descending down. It just shows the tremendous impact and feedback that feedback is having on, on what we do. So um, let's go start more into the into the implications of this but let's start by saying why do goats avoid eating the no, the more nutritious new growth of black brush and the reason is that those new twigs the bark of those twigs is incredibly high in tannins 70 percent tannins and for most of the goats let's say 80 percent or so it's very strong feeding deterrent and they're learning without going into the stories they're learning based on feedback a naive goat will sample some of that new growth. And once it eats enough of that to get the feedback that it's not good, it stops eating the current season's growth. So they're learning based on feedback about the high concentrations of tannins in that plant part. And that's why, why they're avoiding that. Um, why does polyethylene glycol increase preference for new growth? Polyethylene glycol has a very high affinity for binding to tannins. So if animals are provided just a very little bit of that, and this goes for goats, for sheep, for cattle, um, they can eat far more of, of high tannin containing plants, plants that would otherwise be, be aversive to animals. And in Africa, there used to be a, uh, a commercially available uh, uh, supplement called Browse Buster. And Browse Buster was based on polyethylene glycol. That's what was the active ingredient. And it was used to enable animals during drought to ingest some of the very high tannin containing uh, plant species that are there. Uh, we did work with this plant called Ceresia lespedisa in Kansas. Ceresia lespedisa is very high in tannins to the point where cattle don't want to eat it. And what we were able to show is that if we supplemented cattle with a little bit of polyethylene glycol, they could eat, eat a large amounts of Ceresia. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending that, that a person do that. I'm not recommending for it or against it. I think there are other ways that, that I'm going to talk about that we can accomplish um, Get, enabling animals to eat plants that they might not ordinarily eat. But this is simply to illustrate the point that feedback is mediating um, liking for food and that if we change feedback, in this case by supplementing with polyethylene glycol, then we, we change liking. And we were working with people in Israel at that same time when we were doing the studies with polyethylene glycol and uh, we we're working with cattle and goats. They were working with cattle, sheep, and goats, and, and it works no matter where on the planet you are uh, to enable animals to eat really high tannin plant species. So why do goats eat wood rat houses? Um, what you realize is that these houses uh, have many different rooms to them. There's different... Um, places where they sleep. There's the different rooms inside those houses. And one of the rooms is the bathroom. And the bathroom is soaked in urine and feces. And what the goats in this pasture figured out was that that, that nitrogen soaked vegetation was a non-protein source of nitrogen. It was a supplement. And they formed a very strong preference. They, they virtually wiped out all of the wood rat houses that were up there on this cactus flat where we were working. Um, and after three months of being on those pastures, they were in much better body weight and condition than the goats in the other five pastures that hadn't figured that out. This was an amazing thing, and it's an important point. 
Over three winters, we had 18 groups of goats, 18 different groups of goats, but that group there in the upper, the Angoras there in the upper picture, that's the only group that ever figured out that wood rat houses were a source of nutrients. Now, you know, you may think that's kind of an oddity, but what's interested me most during my career is to look for look for the outliers, look for the how the innovators, how do animals innovate within landscapes? And then as we'll talk about in the last presentation I'll give, that knowledge becomes so important for animals surviving in landscapes. The little things that they figure out how to do that then becomes a part of the culture really makes animals locally adapted to the landscapes they inhabit. And that was my first experience watching that and then thinking about that and realizing, you know, it's not just about genetics. It's about what these animals are learning in their environment and how to use those environments and, uh, and then how that gets transmitted from one generation to the next. So let's springboard off of that. Why do, there's been some really neat papers written in the scientific lit literature. I remember one, the title's popping into my head by a good friend and colleague in Canada, Don Beasley, um, <clears throat> titled Carnivorous Herbivores. And what she was raising was this point of why do animals eat unusual foods? And the reason is most often that they're experiencing deficits of one sort or another. And when animals get in deficient states, rather than being cautious of new things in the environment, they start to sample really unusual food. So they start to eat soil. You see a couple of pictures there. You see a picture of one cow eating a rabbit. Um, what they're doing is trying different foods. And when bones is another one, when they find a food that meets their, that, that rectifies their deficit, they form a very strong preference for that. I wish I'm not going to take the time, but I can tell you story after story after story about how that works for all these different minerals and so forth and vitamins. But it's not that they're strange. It's not that they don't know what they're doing. It's a natural response. Broaden out the diet, start to sample new and unusual things. When you find something that meets your needs, you form a preference for it uh, when you're in that particular state. And uh, the, uh, well, we just have to leave it at that. But the stories and the, our experiences with that were just amazing over the years to see how that worked, how quickly that could kick in. And how if there's any possibility at all, uh, animals will figure out. And it can be the strangest stuff. They'll eat, they'll lick urine patches. They'll eat feces of animals that are replete and on and on and on. Just all these, what you would consider at the surface level, oh, how strange, how, how uh, maybe stupid the animals are. But it's not that at all. It, it's that they're, they're figuring out how to, how to do in their environment. So... This leads to me naturally to this idea of free choice cafeteria mineral supplements. And uh, we showed, as I was talking about, that animals can rectify mineral deficits. We didn't look at every last mineral uh, that ever was. So I guess a person could say, you know, well, can they figure out this one or that one or the other one? But we looked at a broad range, as you see there, and we showed that they could they uh, put in different states they could rectify that state when offered appropriate choices. So all of our work is supportive of the idea that animals do self-select and can self-select when given free choice mineral supplements. And I've had so many letters from livestock producers over the years just talking about what they see when they move to free choice supplement programs and uh, how it'll vary with obviously with the season of the year, but it'll vary within a season, depending on what pasture they're on and what plant species are there. And we know that different species with different rooting depths have different kinds of mineral profiles. Um, and so uh, it, it just supports this idea that animals have the ability to self-select and to, to effectively use free choice mineral, uh, mineral supplements. The, what we, would recommend when we were working with people back in the day on these kind of things was to think about what kind of uh, 
minerals might be lacking in your environment, work with the animals, start to learn about that. But for instance, uh, when where I was working in northern Utah, uh, cal or copper and sulfur were two that could be issues. So we would free choice those two if we needed to, and then we'd offer a, a trace mineral block. We did that to try to reduce our costs. I, I realize it's costly to, to offer a huge array of different minerals. So we, we would tell people, try to learn your way into this, try to figure out what might be lacking in your environment, work with the animals to try to see what they respond to, all as ways to enable free choice, but also to, um, to cut costs on that. And, uh, you know, as we go along, happy to answer more questions, but that's just to try to touch on this. I saw several questions related to that. Um, this whole idea of self-medication is another issue that gets raised. And there's really two ways to self-medicate. One we would talk about as therapeutically, that is the animal is sick and it needs to select something to, to rectify that illness. The other is prophylactically, that is to say preventatively. And let, let me just speak briefly to each of those um, and how animals recover after a hard night on wherever they are or out on the landscape, I guess that was there. But we showed that, at, that livestock can learn to self-medicate under a variety of different, they can do it for acidosis if they're on high grain rations in the feedlot, they can do it to rectify bloat. They can do it to, to alleviate uh, illness from certain kinds of toxins. And then this whole idea of internal parasites, you know, tannin containing plants. Um, we showed that animals can, can learn to self-select for high tannin plants when they have high parasite loads. If the parasite loads are, are if we were to treat them with, with dewormer, then they'll avoid some of the plant species that they might eat if they have high parasite loads. So for instance, when goats are treated with Ivomec, they no longer use some of the tannin containing medicinal shrubs. So it's simply to say that animals can recognize different states in themselves, and then they can learn to select things that will, that will rectify those, those states. But they can also, and, uh, they can also forage in ways that, that prevent, prevent illnesses. And, you know, when, when I was early on in my career, there were many of us that were studying food selection of domestic and wild animals both. And we would see on, on these extensive rangelands, you know, 50 to 75 plants may be in a meal, and that can vary, uh, you know, from season to season, but they, they'd select a wide range of different plant species in small amounts. And we would see, you know, three to five to seven species may make up the bulk of the diet within any one meal, but there you'd always have these many, many other species. And back in the day, we didn't uh, pay so much attention to that. We were focusing on what's the primary part of the diet and not giving much, much um, value, actually, I would say, to all these other species that were showing up. Uh, but I've really changed my views over time with that. I, all these little things eaten in small amounts, one could say that's a way that animals flood cells and organ systems with these secondary compounds that are best eaten in small doses. And there's a literature that's starting to come that young people are doing now that are showing when, when they offer animals uh, in dairy, for instance. I was just reading some studies out of Switzerland. Really neat to see. Offer them some medicinal herbs. Their health, their productivity, their, it all gets better. And, uh, you know, so people are starting to show that not only nutritionally are animals better off, but um, physiologically, immune system, um, all these different things are being benefited. So health is enhanced then when livestock graze these phytochemically rich mixtures of grasses, forbs, shrubs, and trees. And it's not just the three to five that make up the bulk of the diet. It's this tremendous array of different species that are really helping them to self-medicate prophylactically. And so <clears throat> I say nowadays, and this is some 
rangeland that's up here in Montana, tremendous diversity of plants. And you look at the cattle that are there, there's a cow and a calf, and then they're just in great condition. And you, you know that those people aren't needing to provide mineral rocks probably, and they're not needing to, to doctor animals up on those landscapes. So I think to the degree that a person can, can enhance biodiversity of landscapes, I think nothing's more important for health nu through nutrition than landscapes that have this tremendous variety of different plant species. Um, there's pasture studies now where people are working on, on the, the pastures, not on extensive rangelands, but they're showing that health improves when livestock graze mixtures of plants and that these tannin containing plants are playing some probably some pretty important roles um, that we know that tannins in the diet can can enhance protein nutrition of animals the tannins bind to the proteins and they're digested down in the 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 in the lower GI tract, which is kind of a bypass protein, if you're familiar with that term in ruminant nutritionist, ruminant, ruminant nutrition, ruminant nutritionists use bypass protein to main, to feed high quality protein to ruminants. So um, tannins play that role. Tannins also are good for internal parasites as we were talking. They're also showing on these pasture studies, looking at how long does it take to finish animals on pastures that the animals, uh, sheep and cattle gain weight more efficiently uh, with less emissions of, of some of these greenhouse gases. Tannins are playing roles in that as well. They help to reduce methane emissions. And by the way, they, they bind with, with proteins. They help to mitigate nitrous oxide kind of uh, uh, issues. So they gain weight more efficiently and they can reach slaughter condition as quickly, nearly as quickly as animals in feedlots. So there's some really interesting research that's being done on pastures where they're thinking about all these issues related to, um, to the health of livestock, the performance of livestock, to greenhouse gas emissions. And as we'll talk next time, looking at, well, what's that do to the uh, phytochemical and biochemical characteristics of meat and dairy products that are produced by those animals, but we'll, we'll save that for, for next time. Um, these biochemically diverse diets also enable sequences that complement one another. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, endophyte infected tall fescue, if you look at the upper part of your um, screen, uh, is very high in alkaloids and it can cause some really severe uh, symptoms in cattle that, that, that are on diets that, that are too high in endophyte infected tall fescue. Well, one of the things we've come to realize from studies is that an appetizer of a tannin containing plant, I put bird for trefoil there, it could be sandfoin, it could be bitter brush, it could be any high tannin containing plant can help animals to eat more uh, tall fescue. And the reason is that the tannins have a very high affinity for binding with nitrogen containing compounds. And that's alkaloids are, have nitrogen as part of their structure. And so the tannins bind the alkaloids and they, they pass through the body. They aren't absorbed as, uh, as, the, as these tannin alkaloid complexes go through the the GI tract. They end up in the feces rather than, than being absorbed into the body. So animals are able to, to in healthful ways, eat more, more of the endophyte infected tall fescue. Uh, we showed those kind of things with rangelands plants like bitterbrush and sagebrush. An appetizer of bitterbrush helps sheep and cattle to eat more, more sagebrush. Again, the tannins in this case are binding up some of the terpenes and so they're not being absorbed into the body and setting limits on intake. Um, we'll go into this more next time, um, but these phytochemically rich diets increase the diversity of species in the microbiome of the rumen and of the soil. And uh, let's just, for sake of time, let's, let's leave that. We'll, we'll explore that more in the next, uh, next, next session. So years ago, I was visiting with a, a livestock producer and he said, you know, what you're finding is really helping to explain 
why cattle perform so well on what people here in, in the Kansas area would consider the, the mix of species from hell. Ceresia lespedisa, which we talked about a little bit earlier, and then this endophyte infected tall fescue. Well, one realizes that Ceresia is high in tannins, they're binding with the alkaloids in tall fescue. And this producer said, I put my four daughters through college on that mix of plants. So I see it as a really good mix of plants. The work you're doing is helping to explain why that mix is so complementary. Um, more generally though, I, as I work with extension specialists who are working with people who are, are planting more diverse pastures, they're telling them that morbidity and mortality decreases. Uh, for instance, when stalker cattle have access to diverse arrays of species as opposed to a monoculture. And to me, it makes sense for the reasons that we're, we're talking about here. Um, if you move to rangelands, and I featuring Glenn Elzinga here, who um, runs uh, all, owns Alder Spring Ranch, and what he's doing is using shepherding practices uh, throughout the, the, the late spring, summer, and early fall grazing season. They're using shepherding practices to create these complementarities and sequences. And he talks about how the amazing performance of his animals and that he doesn't need to feed mineral anymore as a supplement because the animals are being exposed to such diverse arrays of plants that, that contain what they need. He doesn't have to doctor on those landscapes. It's, it's quite a story, but it relates again to this idea of choice and ability to choose offering animals, a diverse array of different alternatives. Um, Glenn uh, read this book, The Art and Science of Shepherding, my tapping the wisdom of French herders. My friend and colleague Michel Miret in France spent his life working with shepherds and learning about their practices. And, and then Glenn was learning about those practices, reading this book and thinking it would really work for him. But what the shepherds do when they look across a landscape, um, and we know there's different vegetation types or habitat types, whatever we want to call it, and that they're all going to vary. And they talk about everything from first rate to disgusting and so forth. But what they figured out how to do is to create complementarities and sequences that enable animals, and this is goats, sheep, and cattle, all three, to utilize all the forage resources on, on a pasture. And so this shepherd in the, in the bottom of the picture there looking across those landscapes He's knowing those different kind of vegetations and he's knowing how to move animals so that there's appetizers, main courses, booster stages, desserts, and their knowledge and the nuance that's involved in what they're doing is, is absolutely phenomenal. There are ways that they're able to um, enable individuals to regulate their intake of primary and secondary compounds, stimulate appetite and intake, and then they use it very much as cons for conservation practices to target graze, to enhance and maintain biodiversity of those landscapes. That's a very, very important point. So they're, they're doing multiple kind of objectives in the work that, that they're doing there. Um, so, and the, the shepherds realize too that animals can learn to, to eat foods that you think they wouldn't ordinarily eat. Um, my friend and colleague Kathy Voth has developed a whole pre program on training animals to be weed eaters. And it's the very same ideas. You know, she was working with thistle, sericeo, with knapweed and different ones, but animals can learn. And the shepherds really think about how training programs, using training programs, and that's what Kathy was thinking about. How do we develop training programs so that animals can, we can set animals up so that they can have success eating, eating weed species. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of nuance to it. And, uh, but it lets you, uh, saying this to, is it lets you know that what we think of oftentimes is something that's horrible, that animals will never eat it. Um, it's, it's worth a real think about um, why they're avoiding it and then ways that you can set them up to, to utilize that. Um, we did a lot of work with this fella here, Ray Bannister, ranches out in eastern Montana. 
And uh, he did that through grazing management and the ways that he was moving animals and the ways that he was, you know, holding them on particular paddocks until they cleaned their plates. But we were doing work like I'm talking about to show that animals can learn these complementarities and sequences. And he and I used to talk early in the morning time and time again. He'd say, well, everybody tells me animals won't eat snowberry. They don't, cattle don't eat it. They can't. Or they don't eat weeds like leafy spurge or, or knapweed or sagebrush. And we, I was telling him, well, we're doing studies that show that depending on the combinations of plants that animals are mixing in their diet, they can indeed eat some of these species, but they've got to figure out sequences uh, that enable that. And so what he talks about and what we came to conclude is that rather than eating the best and leaving the rest, livestock can learn to mix the best with the rest. And uh, so I know I'm going quickly and there's a lot of nuance to this, but Grazing management can change food and habitat selection behaviors. And if a person's aware of these kind of things, and you don't have to be a shepherd necessarily, uh, there's ways that there's ways that, that 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 can be accomplished. Obviously, that's going to depend on the specific environment where you are, the plant species that are that are there, and so forth. But it's uh, I guess the bottom line would be that that. Um, if there's choices that are on landscapes, a person can start to think about how to set up complementarities and sequences that enable animals to do what a person wants done in, in, their, in their environment. Let me say one more thing here, and then I'm going to pose a question to, to Larissa. But, you know, one of the key things about biodiversity is that it enables individuality. And it's the, there's no way to overstate this point for any creature. Doesn't matter whether it's a, a bacteria or a uh, a ruminant or an, a primate or a, a human being. There's no two creatures have ever been alike on this planet ever in the history of it. Um, we know that each human being is unique to the point where a bloodhound can track us by our odors. Um, we can be identified by our fingerprints. If you look inside of each one of us at the organ systems that we possess, at the function, the form of those and the function, they're vastly different one from another. And so there's no reason that we would ever expect that we would like and benefit from eating the same uh, foods were, were each different, and that gets reflected in our preferences, in our liking for, for different foods. And you see it around you all, all the time. Uh, I see when I sit down to eat with my wife a meal, there's things I really love. She couldn't just care less for them and so forth. So she offers us a variety of, of foods, basically. But let me, let me drive that point home even further. Um, this is some data we collected years ago. 24 lambs, they're as uniform as we can get them in terms of breeds, all the same sex, all the same breed, all the same age. They're, they're the spitting image of one another, and yet you offer them the, the simplest of choices, and we did this over, over a month-long period. Just give them a choice between bar, rolled barley and alfalfa, and you have everything from individual one there that wants basically nothing to do with barley and really goes for alfalfa all the way across to animal 24 loves barley and way less interested in alfalfa. Um, you know, these animals were all growing just fine. It's not that that animal 24 over there was doing much better than animal one. No, not the case. They're all growing just fine, but they're doing it in ways that meet, meet their, the needs of their body. Um, when it comes to to the goats, and I, you know, let me back up. There's a point that maybe in the question and answer, or maybe in another another session, I'd like to raise this. When you start, we did studies with cattle where we were finishing them <clears throat> um, two months, last two months on a finishing uh, diet, 
and we offered half of the cattle a total mixed ration, so they had no choice. The other, um, the other half, we offered them a choice of the ingredients in the total mixed ration. And it was amazing to see the efficiencies that got built in when you offered choice. They ate less food, they performed just as well, but it cost far less to finish them because each individual was allowed to meet its own needs. It's a huge, huge point that we don't recognize. Um, when it comes to, to uh, high tannin new twigs in black brush, 80% of the goats aren't interested in eating much of that growth, but there's another 20%, 10 to 20% love it. Uh, it's because they're built different, they have difference in form and function, and that enables that to, them to use that. Um, when it comes to poisonous plants like larkspur, for instance, uh, here's work that was done at the poisonous plants lab. They're looking at, at two, four, five different um, cattle breeds. And the key point is that there's more variation within a breed than across breeds. There's tremendous variation in ability to eat that plant and not have harmful effects to the body of the individual. So, and we're going to go this way when, when we talk in that third session, we're going to talk about local adaptation. What's it mean for animals to be locally adapted to the landscapes they inhabit? And part of that is, is realizing that a person can select for animals that are able to do what a person needs done in the environment. And it involves not only the genome, it involves epigenetics, gene expression, and it involves cultural kind of facets. But I'm simply trying to point out here that there's this tremendous kind of amount of variation and that that really has functional significance then in terms of what we can do on landscapes. And every study we ever did um, during the last probably 20 years of my career, we emphasized that in the publications. Yeah, we had differences in treatments, but we've got this tremendous variation among the individuals and it's important. So, so Larissa, a question for you. I've got two more short sections here. Uh, one is why do livestock, so I've been arguing animals have this nutritional wisdom and if that's the case then why do they die from eating poisonous plants is one question and then there's a, a final question that would have to do with, um, with, with feeding animals, with, with feeding animals in confinement and, uh, and this relationship between what I like to talk about is skin and gut defense systems and and uh, performance of animals in, in feedlots. So I guess a question is, we, we're a little bit over, um, and I could see one of two ways of approaching this. One would be to go ahead and finish this today, or the other would be to say, okay, let's let's stop here, let's have question and answer for the next 20 minutes, and then we would pick up here the next time. Um, so I guess that's a question for you, Larissa, which way you want to want to approach this? Well, I'm just looking through there. There have been a couple questions that have come in, but um, and maybe there are more on, on folks mind. Um, but, um, you know, I am I will kind of looks like we're getting some feedback that people want to finish the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let, let's do it. I mean, then maybe we can, you know, if there's, we we definitely, I definitely, I know you feel, don't want to ignore questions. That's so, you know, I mean, the conversation is, is such an important part of this. So um, let's finish this and then let's see if people want to stay a little bit longer. Maybe the next time we could, could even start with some question or however, and I'm happy, I want to say this too, um, I'm happy to um, to visit with people one on one, to take email messages related to to their people specific situation. So, you know, trying to get to I'm the talking head here because need to <laughs> need to do this. But but what I think is so valuable are the questions and discussions. So we'll we'll finish this and then we'll go from there. So why do animals eat poisonous plants then? Um, let me give three examples here, and we'll, we'll build on this as we go. I worked with people at the Poisonous Plants Research Lab in Logan, great friends and colleagues throughout my entire career. Uh, 
and and it was so interesting to to see all the kind of work that they were doing with livestock producers but i think one of the conclusions that they reached over over many years is it's often it's mismanagement it's uh, not always but it's oftentimes our mismanagement and our inability to understand when we're putting animals in a box that they can't that they can't get out of that that's the problem so i guess the idea would be that we should think carefully about what we're doing and look in the mirror and think have we somehow without realizing it put these animals in a box and they're doing what they're doing not because they're not wise but because we've really set them up for disaster and that's would be the case with halogeton there this is a young uh, this is a plant that's very succulent it's very high in nutrients i mean it looks fabulous actually it looks like when you look at it um you think it's the best plant going, and it grows in these salt desert shrub rangelands, uh, not only in, in Utah where we were, were working and other people were working with it, but in other parts of the world. So you have this halogeton, and uh, there was a train wreck in Utah that happened many, many years ago, probably 50, 60 years ago, where sheep were moved from one environment to the salt, uh, a different environment, to the salt desert shrub ranges. They'd been trucked for a long ways. They were hungry, they were thirsty, and they turned them loose on, on this halogeton. And the next morning, thousands of sheep were dead. The pictures are just stunning, stunningly sad, stark. And uh, well, what had happened here, you have these hungry sheep, they in put into a new environment. They aren't familiar with the plants in that environment. And here's this halogeton looks fabulous. And in fact, it is incredibly nutritious. So they chowed down on the halogeton. What happened though was that halogeton is high in oxalates. And those oxalates uh, are what, what killed them. Come to find out, and the former head of the poisonous plants research lab, Lynn James, did his PhD thesis. This is ages and ages ago on halogeton. And what he showed was that if they'd have had uh, a week to 10 days to gradually come on to halogeton, they wouldn't have lost an animal. Why? Because microbes in the Reuben, microbial populations that break down oxalates would have had a chance to build up in the Reuben. So, and, and then it wouldn't have been a problem. So that was a mismanagement, uh, you know, and uh, not blaming or anything, but that's, you know, I was just not recognizing what what a disaster could be and being able to avoid it. Local weeds, another one that's very interesting, and that illustrates what I refer to as feedback traps. And we get it; every creature does. And next time we could talk about humans and the way that we get into these feedback traps. But let's stick with local weed here. Local weed greens up early in the year across huge areas. It's a very common; it's a leguminous plant, very common. Uh, and across broad areas of the western United States anyway, and probably more than that, but it greens up very early in the spring. And if livestock that are naive to, to this plant and are put out there when it's the basically the only plant available, that again sets them up for problems. And it's a very nutritious plant, so here's where the feedback track comes in. The animals eat that plant if they're naive to it, and they have very positive feedback from the energy and protein and minerals that are in the plant. But what happens is there's a delayed, and this is delayed by days and weeks and even months, a delayed aversive effect where the alkaloids that are in local weed will, will kill cells throughout the body, and they specifically will kill cells in the central nervous system. So hence the name local weed. Uh, the animals become crazy. And by the time that they figure it out, it's too late. They've, If they can even figure that out, which is a question because the plant is like a tro Trojan horse. It's snuck in the back gate. You eat it and, and it's great. It's fabulous uh, in terms of the, the immediate positive feedback. The delayed aversive effects are what, what get the animals. And uh, you know, there, there's so many examples of feedback traps in from a human standpoint, but that's that's a case. And so what's the recommendation? You know, if loco is the only thing that's out there, um, hold, 
you've got to hold off putting animals out there. When they've got choices of other plant species, they'll mix in a little bit of local wheat, a small amount, eaten in small doses, it's not a problem. But it's when it's the primary thing that's available early, really early in the spring, you can set animals up for problems. So again, it's knowing your animals, knowing the landscape. And you know, one of the things that people at the Poisonous Plants Lab were saying over their careers, we're all old and retired now, but they said, you know, we've noticed a shift. As old ranchers that knew their animals and knew their landscapes have moved on, have retired, we're seeing more problems with poisonous plants, with poisoning. It's because young people that are naive and haven't learned about the kind of things that, that the old timers knew are, are not recognizing uh, situations like with halogen or like with local weed that can cause problems. The last example here I'll use is larkspur and this idea of deception. And let me build on that just a little bit because it illustrates some points. Now, the people at the Poisonous Plants Lab did a tremendous amount of work with larkspur because some of the greatest losses are to larkspur. And I have a lady here in Montana wants to spend a, get on the Zoom and talk about larkspur because they having problems with it with their cattle. And so <clears throat> what they came to find out in working with in, in several states with lots of different producers is this is the basic picture they saw. If you look at alkaloid concentrations over time from the early vegetative stage to when the plants mature, what they're doing is they're really high early on and then they drop. And then when the plants mature, they're low. And so they're not an issue out here. And actually they're not an issue here because they're high enough that animals avoid it. Animals don't eat larkspur during, um, during the vegetative stage. But it's during this transition, this toxic window, uh, and when larkspur is entering into the reproductive stage, when it's flowering and then putting on its, its seed pods, alkaloid concentrations are going down and palatability is going up. And this is the time when the animals are most susceptible to eating larkspur. So that leads, in some cases anyway, that leads to a management recommendation of trying to avoid larkspur during that during that toxic window time, trying to avoid the, the parts of the range that are highest in, in, um, in larkspur, these big bunches of tall larkspur during, during that time. But the problem for the animal is simply, it's been avoiding, 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 and then it hits this place here. And if it eats too much during that time, then you get the poisoning. And if you look at what individual animals do, you know, this is one animal looking at it over a month long period. You know, larkspur is a percent of the diet. They cycle up and down and up and down and up and down. And when they get a big dose like here, they'll decrease their intake. So it, they are regulating in a sense, cycling up and down. But if, if back in this time, they way overdo it, then you can then a person can end up with problems. So larkspur is a tricky one, and it requires some careful management. But this idea of toxic window is really important. And so a person can go on and on and on with different kinds of poisonous plants. But I put these three in as simply examples of of uh, ways that animals can can get into troubles, and that that we can set them up for troubles as well. So that takes us back to why did cattle in Apache County die from eating poisonous plants while those in Hia County didn't? And we haven't covered all this really carefully. We've, we've alluded to it though, and you can think of different things. Well, you know, the plants that, that were growing in Apache County, perhaps are growing on different sites, different soils. Um, they may be the same species, but they may be they may have higher concentrations of some of the compounds that can poison cattle. And so cattle eat the same amount that they were used to eating in, in Hia County, and now it's an overdose. So uh, that's one problem. Different mixes of plants. Um, you know, maybe in, in, uh, in Hia County, the animals had learned to mix in this appetizer uh, sort of sense that I was talking certain plants in that really help them. And when they're put into Apache County, now maybe they don't have those plants available. I don't know that from, from what Mick Holder sent us, but that's a possibility. 
There's also this idea of stress, and we'll end on that notion too. You know, there's been a lot of studies do, done to show that the amount of toxin that an animal, including a human, including a rat or <laughs> livestock in this case, can ingest depends on the amount of stress. Um, when animals are in an unstressed situation, they can handle a greater toxin dose than when they're in a stressful situation. And some of the work was done specifically with regard to an environment. Um, drug overdose in humans, you, you, you have the same amount of a, of a drug in a familiar environment, it's not nearly as toxic as it is if you take it in a totally unfamiliar environment. I used to always tease my grad students in classes. So what's the implications? If you don't have much money and you want to get drunk, go to an unfamiliar bar. Anyway, I shouldn't say that. But, but you know, it's this idea that, that, that familiarity can influence that. We'll talk more in the last. The other that's really... Um, Maybe not obvious at first, but but it it's really a key point is that the the familiar food you know, even if it is toxic, you it, it's it's the toxin you know versus the ones that you don't know. If you've ever had the experience of traveling to another country, totally unfamiliar country, um, and you don't know where to go eat, you don't have a clue of where where to go eat. It's funny to see because Steve, international students used to always te tease me and tease. He said, you look for the golden arches. You look for something that's familiar. And that's a huge, huge thing, not just for humans, but for other animals, this whole novel familiar dichotomy. And uh, we're going to tie this in with mother. But what one of the key roles mother plays is to help make young animals starting in the womb familiar with the environment. and. Uh, and knowing what's what's familiar, what's safe, what's not safe. So this idea, if nutritional state's adequate, familiarity breeds content, novelty breeds content. Animals are neophobic. They sample novel foods cautiously uh, and so forth. So this novel familiar dichotomy is important and it, it'll play in here on these. I'm gonna let this example go for the sake of time. It's just simply illustrating that same point and how animals key into that. Um, but what we, we did studies where we would show that if you an, offer animals um, familiar foods, in this case, barley, oats, alfalfa, and corn in a meal, and that's on day one, and they've eaten all these, and you offer them an unfamiliar food, rye, in this particular case here, and then you follow that meal with a mild toxin dose, the next day, the animals avoid the novel food not the familiar food. So animals are associating consequences, in this case, negative consequences, post-ingestive feedback with, with the novel food, not the, not the familiar foods. Um, and that links back then with, with going back to, to the animals in that, in that, uh, in that case of the, the cattle in Arizona that um, they're put into a totally unfamiliar environment. The foods they're familiar with are perhaps some of the toxic plant foods. They're sticking with those. And uh, when they eat those foods, then there's this negative consequence. But in this case here, it was followed by, by death, which was, was a sad deal. Hopefully that's, that's making sense. So we'll link all that back with mother in the third session. Let me do the last part here on skin and gut, and then we'll, we'll go from there. You know, we did a lot of work, and I saw this was a question, too, on training animals to avoid eating particular plants. And where that really took off was with people in vineyards, and they wanted to, to have really good understories in their vineyards, a uh, mix of species. And, but they didn't, and they wanted to get sheep grazing in those vineyards, but they didn't want those sheep to be eating the grapes, the grape leaves and so forth. And so we did a lot of work. We weren't starting out working with people in vineyards. Uh, we, were, we were just asking the question, can you train animals to avoid eating particular plants? And you can. You, you know, it's best if you start them. They've never seen the food before. It's a novel food, just what I was saying in that last slide. And then 
when they get exposed to it, you follow that with the toxin dose. So we worked out procedures of how, how to do this. Um, but it, it all got into us a further understanding of what animals learn. So for instance, that sheep in that pen, it's, it's just eating a, a plant that we want to train it to avoid. And we used to wonder in those days, well, then we go over and we take a balling gun and a capsule with lithium chloride and we put that, um, you know, administer that capsule. And we were naive back in the early days, but we thought, won't they associate that with us? Won't they, won't they realize that we're causing the problems here that, um, and so they don't learn to avoid the plant we want them to avoid, they learn to avoid us. But that comes to this idea of these skin and gut defenses. And what we didn't understand then is that this post-ingestive feedback is what they're going to be relating with the food. Food and feedback from eating that food and this capsule is what they're going to, to learn. They're going to associate that. Now, they may not want to be around us. That's the skin defense system. So we've come over, we've grabbed them. We've, so we've become, quote, a predator in that sense. So this idea of skin and gut defense and that they're different and that that is important in terms of training animals when you're, when you're trying to train animals uh, to avoid foods or to avoid places in the environment or to use foods or to use places in the environment, skin and gut defenses become very important to understand and appreciate. And I'm not going to go into more detail. I could spend a lot of time on that alone. But the point I want to drive to and conclude with is that skin and gut defense systems are mutually inhibitory. And I always thought of this quote <clears throat> that Kappa wrote. It was he, he was on the, it was on the Normandy invasion during World War II. And he says, the mess boys of the USS Chase wore immaculate white jackets and served hot cakes, sausages, eggs, and coffee with unusual zest and politeness. But the pre-invasion stomachs were preoccupied and most of the noble effort was left on the plate. So this, they're about to have severe assault on skin de defenses. And you're not hungry. You're not going to eat. And that's the point I want to go after for livestock is that when they're stressed, they're like these pre-invasion stomachs. They're not going to be eating and performing well and then thinking about ways that, that we may or may not stress them and how that affects immune responses and animal performance. So um, we did a lot of work with, with um, Ted Turner and the managers of, of the many, many ranches that he owns in Bison. And uh, we were looking at this idea of stress and social organization in Bison and, uh, you know, when they were trying to finish bison in feedlots, the way that you would finish cattle, they were having train wrecks, horrible, horrible performance. And so we started working with them, trying to understand what all was going on socially, as well as from the standpoint of food selection. And part of the social thing has to do with social organization. Bison live in families. They live in extended families. And understanding those families and understanding the dynamics of those families played into how you finish them. And then we started working on, you know, well, if you put them in tight confinement like you would livestock versus loose confinement, if you give them choices versus total mixed rations, all these were having big influences on, on how well bison performed and how they finished and what we were finding is that loose confinement giving choices to animals had higher daily gains than animals that were in tight confinement or animals with no choices or than animals that were simply allowed to stay out on rangelands with the, with their families but what we found was that the range the animals left on rangelands were the least costly to finish so they ultimately provided the highest net returns, if that makes sense. So you're getting higher performance uh, in the confinement, the loose confinement, but it's costing you more. And so living in family groups um, was a low cost way to do it. And it also reduced stress. When we looked at cortisol levels under tight confinement or loose confinement or free range, this graph here in the bottom the tight confinement had the highest stress levels, the loose confinement less, but the animals on rangelands had the, had the least levels of stress. Um, so we went on and uh, my colleague Juan Vialva has done a lot of really interesting studies comparing sheep that are fed a monotonous diet, a TMR, 
versus sheep that are, have a variety of different foods when they're fed a, uh, a variety of foods. They do less cribbing, lower levels of stress measured through cortisol. They eat more, uh, they're more readily eat novel foods, higher body weight grain. So this idea uh, that the choices we offer animals really matter in terms of their, not only their performance, but their levels of stress and how that relates back to performance is the issue. So let's finish with, with feedlots. And, you know, I'm not trying to, to uh, how do I say this, to be like the, the big critic or whatever. I, I, I have to say, though, I thought about these issues throughout my career um, as we did different kinds of studies. It's like, oh, boy, that relates to feedlot animals and so forth. And I say this saying that I've had a lot of friends in feedlots and that, that feedlot nutritionists and so forth. So for whatever this is worth, take it with that. But, you know, so you have animals in feedlots with total mixed rations. They're formulated for the average animal. As we said, there's no average animal. And so you're going to have some animals over consuming, some animals under consuming. There's an inefficiency that, that's, that's built into that. On these high grain rations, we did studies where we were feeding animals anti-emetic drugs. Why would you do that? Well, we were trying to understand what is the animal experience when it eats too much of a plant that contains a toxin that causes it to avoid the plant the next day, like the black brush and the new, new twigs where they learn quickly not to eat those. And uh, as part of those studies, we had animals on high grain rations and we found, man, you know, if you give animals an anti-emetic drug, they eat more of a toxic plant. They'll eat more endophyte infected tall fescue. They'll eat more food that, that's uh, been laced with lithium cord. And they'll eat a lot more of, of very high grain rations. Is that smart to do that? No. The, what we've done is we've knocked out part of a system that allows them to experience feedback and to limit their intake. So, so um, what, what we were finding from that is, ah, these animals that are on really high grain diets are experiencing mild nausea and, uh, and aversion. Um, then there's issues related to mo monotony and stress, the same food. Just imagine for yourself, and it's no different for these animals. If you had to eat the same food for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, day after day after day, week after week after week, that's, um, we'd we, we would hate it. We would absolutely hate that. And we'd come to form an aversion to the food. I remember my wife one time when we were building a house, um, we we're living in a trailer and we had our, our young children and she was cooking chili once a week. Even that was too much. Kids saying we're sick and tired of eating chili. Well, that's the idea there. Then you can go into studies that that we've cited where, you know, these animals, it's they're, they're basically experiencing uh, metabolic syndrome. It, it's not different from, from a human being that's that's having metabolic syndrome and then uh, disease states. Uh, fatty or liver, liver abscesses and, and all that, it, that's the same thing they're experiencing during those finishing periods. And then you've got all the antibiotics that are fed for resistance. So I sound really negative on that, but I think I'll tell you why. Uh, oh, okay. Here's that study then. And the idea of choice and ability to choose for animals. And I, I told you, uh, you know, choice ate less than mixed. They gained weight at the same rate, but it cost far less to feed them because there was an efficiency that we could talk about more. If, you know, each animal was able to better meet its its needs when when they were offered a choice, and that that's a that's a huge deal. Not to mention the stress and so forth. And when we graded them, they all graded just fine. It's simply it cost far less. Um, now you get into all these issues that are coming up more all the time. You know, on What's your protein source? So you're going to be plant-based in terms of your protein or meat-based or a combination of the two, which is what we argue is, is, is best in some of our review papers. But, you know, the issues of, of meat on human health, environmental health, and then this whole issue of animal welfare. And one can, can argue that these five freedoms are, are not, they're, they're all being violated, uh, fear and distress, 
we wean animals and you know prior to world war ii animals were finished on pastures and finished with with their their herd mates you know when you take an animal you wean it and we did this obviously on the ranch uh, you wean them put them on the truck set you know move, sell them that's huge levels of fear and distress uh, animals all know one another been studies to show that sheep in a flock, they all recognize each other's facial characteristics. They all know one another. They know who they are. So you put them in with totally unfamiliar animals, you know, fear and distress. Um, express normal behaviors, eating a total mixed ration uh, is not that related to normal behaviors, hunger and thirst, the discomfort and so forth. So, you know, these are these are issues and I, I raised them not to not as blame or criticism of, of the industry and how that developed, just saying these are our issues and these are issues that young people are thinking about. And so what do we what do we do? I think thinking about, well, what are ways? I'm a strong advocate for the value of livestock on landscapes, on health, on on everything. So how do we how do we uh, work? with animals in ways that recognize the ways that people look at things nowadays. I, th I think that becomes very important. Several years ago, I was down in Uruguay. Um, I was on my way back and on the plane, there was this one of these magazine slikes there. And there was this article titled um, uh, about this. And in this article, she's the lady who wrote it says, it's the diet that makes Argentinian beef unique. Argentinian cattle are grass-fed, explains Ginger Gendrile, director of TV documentary titled Beef is Bueno. Uh, former vegetarian, she converted to meat after moving to Buenos Aires from New York in 2002. She says they walk around. Uh, they live in family groups. For their short lives, they live the way cows were meant to live. I think that's really important for all of us to think about. And we'll, when we come to that last section and we we'll talk about... Um, you know, how do we create locally adapted animals? What's that mean? What are some interesting things for us to think about? And this idea of family and relationships and the role, the positive role that that can play, we'll come back to that. But for now, you know, we know that outfits like Whole Foods and others are, are really starting to pay attention to these animal welfare ratings and, you know, how are we treating animals and what's that mean and so forth. So, um, that is food for thought for, for, for what it's worth. And with that, I know I've gone over and I apologize for that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity absolutely to be here, to be here with all of you. And, uh, sorry to be so much the long talking head. <laughs> way, more, way more to try to cover than what I guess I, I I think people loved it. I don't think there's any any <laughs> any problem. Um, do you have time for just a, a couple questions that came in? I, I want to yeah, be respectful. Yeah, let's of everyone. Do it. Let's, okay. Yes, yeah, let's do it for, for sure, and then let's think of how we can how we can either through one on one email or or talk or next next time, Larissa, if we want to start with the with a couple of questions. Uh, I. Uh, my eyes were bigger than my stomach, obviously, on how much I put in. Uh, and I I talked a little bit more than I – there's just so much that can be said on any of these these ones. And if I don't watch a little bit, I get too long-winded. So, But anyway, go ahead with a couple of questions. Yes, all good. So I'm going to back up a bit. There was a question from Mark who's asking um, – he says, many areas of the country are deficient in selenium. Um but the wildlife don't seem to be affected by this deficiency. Do you have any insight into how they manage to stay healthy in those environments? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And I don't know for certain the, the answer to that question, but let me tell you what pops into my mind. Years ago, there was there were some sheep on an island uh, <clears throat> off of the, the coast of the, of the UK, one of the islands there. And that island was the plants, the soils and the plants on that island were really low in copper. And uh, that the sheep had been on that island for generation after generation after generation. And they had adapted in ways that they were able to very, very efficiently utilize copper in their diets. And so if you put, quote, normal sheep on that island, they would be showing a copper deficiency. But these, these sheep over 
all those generations didn't have problems. And it was interesting when they moved those sheep to places that were more copper replete, they could end up with an excess of copper in their diet because their bodies were able to so efficiently utilize the copper. So that's what that's what pops into my mind related to the wildlife species is that they may over generations have been selected. Um, that would be a first thing would be interesting to look into. And those studies, they were done many, many, many years ago. And, you know, I've tried to find my my refer my papers on that and I <laughs> I couldn't find them. <laughs> I, I read about that so, so long ago, and I thought that's really amazing. So, um, but that's a thought that pops into mind, and it would be very interesting, you know, for researchers to look at look at the status of those those animals of the wildlife species related to that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Joni who asks: um, Supposedly, wilting cherry. It's poisonous to cattle. Mine have gotten into it, and I saw nothing different about the cows afterwards, and she watched. Do you have an opinion about that situation? So let me make sure. Wait, what was the plant again, Lord Simon? Wilting cherry. Wilting cherry, huh? Um, and, and so her cattle ate the cherry with no problem, huh? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Well, several things pop into mind again on that. Um, you know, on some of the cherries out here, prussic acid can be a problem with that. And it depends on the time in the growing season. And if there's been a frost, for instance, are the concentrations high or not? Um, so it could, part could be related to the plant itself and the environment it's growing in. And uh, perhaps it's, it's growing, you know, we didn't get into this at all, but <clears throat> depending on the kind of compound that a plant contains, uh, when I used to teach, short courses on this and we'd spend a whole a whole section on plants and plant behavior and that what i passed through very quickly the environment where the plants growing really influences the chemistry and so um you know if if resources if if for instance certain plant species are growing in areas where there's moisture and nutrients available for growth they'll dilute the concentrations of compounds. This is certainly the case with tannin-containing plants. The, the concentrations will be lower, and so animals can eat that without a toxic effect. I hope that's making sense. It, the environment really is influencing the amount of, of, of compounds that are in the plant. You can think of that from a grazing management standpoint too, and it, it's complicated because there's so many different species with many different compounds, but, um, you know, dung and urine on tannin containing plants can really make those plants much more palatable to animals. So that's one area that pops into my mind and it would depend on the plant. The other, you could look at it from the animal standpoint and uh, you know, what the animals are mixing in their diet, how much of that they're eating and have they, have they been able to figure out how to regulate their intake. So really everything that we were talking about could it could enter into that and it's those kind of quote anomalies like you're you're talking about there that i think are very interesting and very important and uh you know whether it's on your own place making those kind of observations and thinking about them and then trying to it seemed like to me the more time we can spend with with animals and i, I know we're all busy nowadays and, and stuff but <laughs> Um, I, Sue and I aren't busy because we're, we're retired now, so I, but, you only uh, have three got, presentations each day. <laughs> we, we've, got, we've got chickens and Sue's wanted to have, that's the one animal we hadn't raised before or worked with. So this, a year ago now we built, I built a chicken coop, a chicken palace really. And, uh, due to some of the regulations in our subdivision, we probably shouldn't have chickens, but they <laughs> turn their eyes the other way, but they don't want them just free ranging. So we turn them out twice a day in the morning and the, and the evening, and we just go around and watch them. We just watch what they do. And um, for me, it's fascinating to see. And, you know, we set up that coop with certain things in mind. Well, maybe they can roost over here. And so they didn't pay attention. They, they love the rafters. That's where they <laughs> want to go. You know, but you just, it's amazing what they can teach us when we spend time 
time just on chicken time in our in our case here. And it's been interesting to see that some of the people that don't know anything about, uh, you know, I've never spent time much with, with livestock or stuff. When they come over and they say, well, we're going to turn the chicken out, just come with us and you know, we could let them go for an hour and watch them chase grasshoppers around and eat eat this plant and eat that plant and the next thing, whatever. The, and people say, oh, it's so it's so calming just to go out with it, just to go watch those chickens. And it's true. You know, they're on a different kind of consciousness, I think, and, and on their own time. It's uh, so that's rambling a bunch. But <laughs> Doing what chickens do. <laughs> right, right, absolutely the case. Uh, but that 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 idea of spending time with animals was really the point, and watching them and trying to see what what they do, um, we 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 all can learn so much from them. There, there's no question about that. Huh? And uh, and then it, it helps with observations like yours. You know, it's it's um, it's different. It's 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 neat to see and then and then i saw i i have a trouble to to read the some of the posts come up come up and disappear quickly but the one i just saw it's right you know looking getting into the plant that you've got and looking at what is the chemistry of that and that's where folks like me can can help a little bit on looking up and then from the chemistry one can start to think about how that chemistry would respond in a particular environment perhaps and so forth so but um, looking at at the plant that, that was mentioned um, for its chemistry is one of the first things that I, I would do. And well, let me think get... about it from that standpoint. But like I say too, and I'm I'm always happy to try to help people um, by email or or with with calls to look up information that can be helpful to people. Um, or, so, or to put them in directions, you know, maybe check with this person or that person or, or whatever. I will be, um, when I send out the follow-up follow up email tomorrow, I will CC you, Fred, if that's okay, so folks can get in touch with you if they need to or would like yeah, to. Absolutely. It's about sharing information, huh? trying to share information and taking people in. That's not how I see the whole thing is trying to share and have the conversation, huh? not not as the talking head or the or whatever, but uh, you know, to share share ideas, get people thinking, huh, about yeah. what might be possible. It's wonderful. It's really great that yeah. I mean, it's been amazing to have this and to be able to have this kind of on record and to be able to share it with other people as well. Um, so just to be respectful of folks' time, um, I am going to just. Uh, to spend a moment just for a couple of housekeeping items before we sign off. We do have Fred with us for the next two weeks. So that is super awesome. And um, hopefully uh, folks will join us again. I will say for the, each webinar does require a separate registration. So please um, be sure to register. I will be sending along the links to those with, um, webinars um, in my follow-up email that will come out tomorrow morning along with links to the slides and to the, the recording so folks can have that to reference. Um, uh, just a kind of a, a plug for some of the other things we have going on. We do have ongoing scholarships, folks that want to get out and do any trainings or workshops or, or conferences, whether that's in person or virtual. Um, fact is provide those. Um, and then we do have some handouts that can be customized for uh, that you can use with your customers or online. So I think um, that is about all the time we have today. So, so much, uh, Fred, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with all of us and um, sharing everything. And it was very enjoyable. And like people said, the, the hour and a half kind of went by in a, in a, you know, in a snap. So it was, it was great. Uh, um, thanks. Thanks to all of you too, really. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, a. Uh, it's a wonderful blessing to be able to spend time with you sharing sharing thoughts. You know, it really is. So thank I, you. And I look forward to seeing you in a week. Huh? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks to everyone out in the audience. Have a great rest of your day and your week. And hopefully we'll be back same time, same place next Tuesday. So um, everyone take care and stay safe and healthy. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>